this Advent season, what we've done is, is continued a series that we had actually started a little earlier uh, in the year where we were looking at God in real life. The, the, what is God like? The attributes of God and uh, the character of God as he revealed them in the scriptures. And then certainly as we came into Advent, it only made sense to continue that because God became in real life. He, we see God in real life in the person of Jesus. And, and, and the glory of God is revealed in Jesus. And so we, we, we used as our text, um, the basis of, that, of our series was from John chapter 1, uh, verse 14, very familiar. The prologue of John says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Speaking of Jesus, became flesh, dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. And then as John finishes that prologue in chapter 1, he says, Look, no man has seen God at any time, but the Son. He's fully made him known. And what we concluded was, John didn't write that in a vacuum. John was pulling from the experience of Moses in Exodus chapter 33 and chapter 34, where Moses had asked, Lord, show me your glory. And God said, no, you, you really can't look on me and live. And, and so you've got this revelation of God, the afterglow of God in chapter 34, where God speaks his name, reveals something of his character, and, and that grace and truth that comes from out of Exodus chapter 34. And so we've been looking at, at, at the life of Jesus, some aspects of the life of Jesus, where we see the character and the glory of God revealed. And so it, it's fitting this morning that we go to a, another text outside of John, but to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And uh, I, I want you to take your Bible, turn there, your device, turn there. Uh, but we're going to pray as we start. Lord, I thank you for... The truth that you have come near. And Lord, you have made yourself known uh, in the person of your son, the Lord Jesus. And as we think about that this morning, of uh, your speaking and making your glory known in the face of Jesus, Lord, I pray that our response would be pleasing to you and honoring to you. For we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. The, the, the text that we're going to be looking at talks about the glory of God in the face of Jesus, the face of Jesus. As I thought about that idea of the face of Jesus, I, I thought about iconic faces. You know, they're those images that, um, that are memorable, face images. So I, I shared some with you. Uh, the, the guy on the left with the beard. Now, there is a difference between first hour and second hour. First hour said George Washington. <laughs> they were kidding. They were kidding. Okay. But Abraham Lincoln. I mean, it's, everybody looks at that image and immediately knows what? Abraham Lincoln. It's one of those iconic faces. You know who it is. The second one is who? Albert Einstein. Einstein. Sometimes when my hair gets a little unruly and it's a little longer, uh, my family calls it the Einstein look. But that, 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 those pictures, those, those, that face that's unmistakably, everybody says Albert Einstein. What about the third one? Now, see, not as many people spoke. This, <laughs> this may be the only time you see a picture of Che Guevara in church. Che Guevara was a Marxist revolutionary in South America. Uh, well, depending on your political persuasion, for some he was a freedom fighter. I just remember, even as I was a teenager, it was often people wearing T-shirts with his face, his image on it, or, or, or banners hanging in windows. Okay. It, what's interesting is they, they didn't even realize who he was or what he represented. What about the last one? Ah, uh, yes. Cassius Clay, who became Muhammad Ali. 
Okay, but in that picture, he would be Cassius Clay. That 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 the, the pretty face, the boxing. But again, it's one of those recognizable faces, and everybody says yes. Probably the most iconic face is the next one, Mona Lisa. The Mona Lisa. Era, yeah. By the way, the, the, the actual picture is not very big. It's hanging in the Louvre. It's, not, it's a very small picture. Um, but yet, that face has, has been studied, it, it, the, the mysterious look, and songs have been written about it, and poems, and all, all kinds of looking at the face of the Mona Lisa. But a recognizable, iconic. There's one more. This is my granddaughter's new iconic look. It's her picture face that somehow she's learned. And uh, every time now you say, Harley, let's take a picture, that's what you get. So for our family, this is becoming memorable. And the one, the brother is, yes, the one who likes presents and stockings and who likes the Grinch. Okay. But the idea of these faces become memorable. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and, and although we're going to allude to uh, other passages, the, the key verse is verse 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of of Jesus. The God who said, let the light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of his glory in the face of Jesus. That's what we're considering this morning. And, and the broader context is, is really Paul is writing about the glory of the ministry. He's talking about the glory of the new covenant. He's talking about how this is for, for this particular time that he's writing. He said, look, there's something markedly different and glorious. And so through chapter 3 and into chapter 4 and into 5, he, he deals with this subject. And we'll allude back to chapter 3 in a moment. But as I thought about this particular verse and the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus, there were some observations I made. The, the glory of God in the face of Jesus is unfading. You say, well, where does that come from? Well, chapter 3. See, chapter 3, he talks about Moses. In, in chapter 3, he alludes, he goes back to that Exodus 33, 34, and the, and the passages that follow. And because if you remember in that story, God gives to Moses a second set of the law because Moses had thrown, he got a little upset and broke the first tablets. God gives him a second set. The new covenant, a covenant and then when Moses comes down from the mountain, they discover something about Moses' face. His face is what? His face is shining. It's a reflection of having been in the presence of God and the glory of God. And so Moses would have to cover his face, veil his face. It wasn't just a, because the people were scared, and, but there was another reason. Moses didn't want them to see that the glory was fading. It didn't stay. And that's what, in chapter 3, Moses, uh, Paul writes about. In contrast to the glory of God fading in the face of Moses, the glory of God in the face of Jesus doesn't fade See, Jesus is greater than Moses. It speaks to the true identity of who Jesus is. Uh, Moses was a great prophet. Jesus was more than a prophet. 
Jesus was the Son of God. He was God in the flesh. He's the eternal sovereign God. The, the things that we've sung about. The, the, what, what, what Craig mentioned, the, this irrationality of the eternal God becoming one of us. But that's who Jesus is. His glory cannot fade. It is his because of who he is. That fixes our hope in an unchanging truth. You see, unfading means it's steady, means it's lasting. It doesn't change. We happen to live in a time that's a little different, again, than the time some of us grew up. And, you know, when I was growing up and still believed this, is that truth is outside of me. That, that truth is something to be sought after, pursued, found, discovered. It's objective. But the times we live in say, uh, no, truth is not out there. Truth is in you. It's whatever you want it to be. You, you don't discover it, you create it. And so you can have multiple truths. What's true for you, what's true for me, even if they're contradictory. The problem is they both can't be true. When I understand that the glory of God in the face of Jesus and who he is, that means that my hope is fixed on something that doesn't change. Because it's a truth that is not within me. It's a truth that God has revealed to us. And with that comes this, that, that it is multi-generational. Those, those pictures, Einstein, Che Guevara, particularly Che Guevara, there is a multi-generational picture. And I say multi-generational because your answers showed sometimes your age. Some of us older ones, yeah, we know who it is. Younger ones, mm, not so sure. Because those iconic faces can be tied to particular generations. But the face of Jesus, the glory of God in the face of Jesus, transcends generations. It's true who he is for every generation. It doesn't matter whether you're old or whether you're young. The glory of God is seen in the face of Jesus. Second observation. The glory of God in the face of Jesus is transformative. Verse 18 of the end of chapter 3. He said this is really, there's no chapter divisions when Paul wrote this. This is one long section. But this is what he says. And we all, with unveiled face, talking about difference than Moses, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. Now, it's transformative in this way. We are transformed into the image of Jesus who is the image of God. Now, let me explain this a little bit. Um, Paul, in his writing to the Colossians, says something like this. He says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. And in Colossians chapter 1, there, there certainly what he means is that the person of Jesus is that he is God in the flesh, that he is deity, fully God. And the writer of the Hebrews says something very similar. He says, look, he is the exact representation of his nature, the, the splendor, the fullness of his glory. Well, when we see that Jesus is in the image of God, what we're, we understand, and our initial thoughts go here, and it's right theologically, is that Jesus is fully God, God in the flesh. That's what we just talked about, the identity of Jesus. 
However, the term the image of God doesn't merely speak to his deity. It speaks to his humanity. How was Adam created in the image of God? How are you created in the image of God? Now, we have a problem. After Adam's sin, that image is distorted. It's marred. It's not a true picture of what God has designed us as human beings to be. There's some brokenness in us. But Jesus, you know, we sang he's son of Adam. See, what he's saying is he's fully man. He's perfect in his humanity. He is the perfect image of God in his humanity. There's no marring, there's no distortion in him. When we think of this as the image of God and this transformative idea, a couple of things pop out. One is that this transformation is the work of the Holy Spirit. That's what Paul says. He says it is through the Lord, the Spirit. This is the work of the Holy Spirit in us, transforming us into the image of Christ, who is the image of God. That transformation is progressive. It's progressive. What what do I mean by that? It it is something that he says is taking place from glory to glory. it's, It's happening in the present. Sometimes we'll use the word sanctification. For for those who believe the gospel of Jesus, he's done something to them to begin that restoration process. To restore us to to what God has designed us to be. That process has begun. The Spirit of God has begun that. And and it's not finished. It's not complete. We'll talk about that in a minute. But the Spirit is changing us to be like Jesus in our character. to, To that brokenness, to give healing to that. But it's, there's an ultimate aspect to that as well. It, it's completed in glory, from glory to glory. Romans chapter 8, very familiar passage, says, All things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For those whom he called, he's predestined to what? Be conformed to the image of his son. See, what is he talking about there? We're going to be conformed. He's predestined us to be conformed to the image of Christ. And in Romans chapter 8, there's an ultimate conformity to the image of God, the image of Christ, and that is glorification. That process has an end in view where the work of restoration is fully completed. That unfading glory in the face of Christ Paul says, that glory, unfading, and it's changing you and changing me. And, and lastly, the glory of God in the face of Jesus is God's gospel. That's God's good news. God's gospel of Jesus brings light to a world of darkness. That, that's the, in the darkness, he says, God said, let there be light. God has shown the light into our heart, which was dark. The gospel, the good news of the glory of God in Christ Jesus dispels the darkness. It brings light to a broken world. I want to tell you, 2020 and 2021 have had some dark days, haven't they? Some of you have lost family members unexpectedly. Death seems to have been so close. Events in our world have reminded us that we live in this broken, dark world. Yes. 
the light of the glorious gospel of God is that there's good news in the face of Jesus. And with that, he breaks the power of Satan and sin in our life. Right before verse 6, this is what Paul said, For the God of this world has blinded the minds of those who believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ shine in. Now listen. I, I, I'm not going to make any apologies for this. I, I believe in a person who is the representation of evil. The God of this world. Who has a hold on this world. Now, sometimes people say to me, well, you're a Christian, you know, one of the great problems of, of Christians that they have to answer is the problem of evil. You've you got to explain why there's evil. If there is a God, why is there evil in the world? Here's my answer. Uh, I may have to explain it, but so do you. The problem of evil in the world is not merely a Christian theistic problem. It's every man's problem. It's the atheist's problem, too. Especially for those who think that man, creation, people, are inherently good. If people are good by nature, but are only corrupted by environment, by education, lack of education, or lack of money, economics, that explains evil. Is it really? Then go to a prison and tell me why a college-educated person who comes from a rich home who has lots of money is sitting in a prison. It's not environment, it's not education, and it's not economics. There's a problem of, with evil in the heart of people, and there's a God of this world who is wreaking havoc. The light of the glorious gospel of Jesus, of God in the face of Jesus, says this. He breaks the power of canceled sin. He breaks the power of Satan, and he breaks the power of sin. That's what the good news is. That's, that's why good people rejoice and sing. And then he says, that this God shines it in our heart. He beckons us to believe. He does the work of shining it into our heart. What he says to us is believe it. By faith, believe the good news of the message I've given. That is, understand who Christ is and what he came to do. God has shown the light of the knowledge of God, the glory of God in the face of Jesus. Here's something we've put together for this coming January. The theme was we beheld his glory and, and I said it began in John's gospel, the prologue of John. So we put together a little devotional book for the month of January. It starts January the 2nd. They're available in the office. It goes 30 days. And it's very simple. Okay, what it does, this is like next week, Sunday, January 2nd, read John 1, 1 to 18. And then the next day, January 3rd, read John 1, 19 to 51. And then there are just four sections. Okay, one section, first section says, just write a brief summary of what you read. As you read it, what, what does it say? Just, just a couple of sentences, what did you read? Number two, what did I learn about Jesus? That reveals his glory. If that's what John, the gospel of John's about, is that the glory of God in Jesus, then what do I learn about the glory of God in Jesus? Thirdly, how can I relate this truth to my life today? Does this apply to my life today? And you know what you'll find? Your life today is going to be maybe different a week from now in terms of how you apply that, your need for the day. And then the last thing is just very simply, write a short prayer that responds to what God has says. God, thank you. God, help me. Just something short. 
but over 30 days for the month of January, okay, it'll take you through the Gospel of John. You know, you know what happens in 30 days? 30 days, you do what, you know? Develop a habit. Some of you are going to be making uh, resolutions this week about, well, I'm going to read my Bible or whatever. So we decided we'd help you out. Okay? So 30 days, not a guarantee. But the idea is, hey, it'll start a habit. And you can look back and as you journal and see about what you learned about Jesus, the glory of Jesus, and how he relates to you today, that you may know Jesus in real life.